Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Liz Pimper, and I'll be your moderator for today's WJE webinar, From the Outside In, Protecting Your Building Envelopes with an Asset Management Plan. During the next hour, WJE experts Scott Chamberlain and Paul Lanteri will discuss how to plan for a multi-structure assessment of building exteriors. They will share common investigative findings and demonstrate how to organize the information gathered to develop a comprehensive plan to repair current problems and minimize or avoid future problems. This presentation is copyrighted by West Janney Alston Associates. And now I will turn it over to Paul to get us started. Paul? Thanks, Liz. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for making time today for this presentation. In the next several minutes, we will outline the benefits of an asset management plan in extending the service life of the exteriors of your buildings. Today's learning objectives are, you will learn the definition of building envelope asset management, what the steps are in developing a building envelope asset management plan, be able to identify typical types of building envelope deterioration and development of an assessment management report and budget. So before we get into discussing the plan, we want to briefly describe the building envelope which is the integration of materials and systems that enclose the interior of a building. It provides support to resist the transfer of loads. It, re it resists water and air leakage, resists heat loss and heat gain, controls vapor movement into and out of the building, and determines the outside appearance of the building. The components of the building envelope or building enclosure include roofs, plazas, exterior wall construction, windows and doors, and below-grade waterproofing. The maintenance of these components is critical to assure this building envelope maximizes its service life in a cost-effective manner. Next, we come to the definition of building envelope asset management, which is understanding the value of building envelope components and developing a plan to maximize this value by planning for the maintenance, repair, restoration, and or replacement of these components. An asset management plan can assist in this maintenance by providing an outline of anticipated restoration work and its estimated costs for use by the client and their accountants for planning future capital reserves. This planning will allow the client to prepare a reasonable reserve fund specifically set aside for the eventual necessary repair or replacement of the building's envelopes components. So who can benefit from this plan? Building owners, prospective building owners, property management companies, institutional and corporate facilities departments, building managers, building engineers, financial officers, accountants, and the board of directors. Clients who have benefited from an asset management plan include colleges and universities, government agencies, religious institutions, condominium associations, entertainment venues, and country clubs. So, what is the general value of an asset management plan? It forms the basis of an effective asset management system by providing guidelines to cost-effectively 
extend the life of building exteriors by adhering to a carefully crafted maintenance schedule guided by specific quantitative data. It provides an outline of prioritized anticipated repair, replacement, and maintenance costs for planning future capital reserves, and it defines the activities necessary to realize an organization's asset management objectives. Some of the specific values of an asset management plan are identifying potential safety hazards needing immediate attention, identifying required maintenance work before more costly conditions worsen to the point where more costly work is needed. This could be like a small crack in the wall that can be easily repaired with sealant or an injected material that after time when water gets into it, maybe the whole brick or stone will fall off the, the building. Can aid in providing safe, reliable, and stable facility operations. Can eliminate or reduce unexpected repair costs. It could identify potential failures that could damage other building systems. This is such as a roof that could develop leaks that could damage interior finishes. It can extend the life cycle of materials, which in the long run lowers costs and the risks of material failures. And it can aid in designing appropriate repairs and restorations in a cost-effective manner. Next, we'll discuss the steps in, de in developing the plan. First, the building assets are inventoried. This is a list of the buildings to be included in the plan. This can be developed by the client prior to retaining a consult consultant or in coordination with the professional consultant. Once the buildings are identified, an investigation is conducted that includes a survey and assessment of the building exterior envelope and identification of the repairs required at the building envelope's components. Then, a maintenance plan is developed based on the findings of this investigation, and once recommendations for the restoration are finalized, a budget is prepared to implement the plan. The budget can also be prepared in conjunction with the recommendations to be sure that the budget is appropriate for the money available that the client has. So, Inventory of the building assets. A consultant can help a client in maximizing the value of available resources to develop an asset management plan. This can be done by answering questions such as, how many buildings are managed? What is the budget for the consultant to prepare the plan? Can we plan for all of our buildings now? or do we need to prioritize and phase the planning? Once the planning is prioritized and the planning budget established, the buildings to be included in the plan or first phase of the plan are identified. These are compiled on a list that can include the names of the buildings, their functions, age, floor area, height, number of stories, and any other helpful information. This other information can be just saying that it's a masonry wall construction, a curtain wall, wood construction, or, or any other valuable information.
Step two is the condition assessment, where facts on the structures are gathered. The condition assessment begins with a review of existing documents related to the building envelope. These include original construction drawings and specifications, product data and shop drawing submittals, active warranties, and previous assessment reports that are available. The document review is followed by interviews with property managers, building engineers, and occupants. These interviews are helpful in discovering existing problems such as leaks and material deterioration as well as a repair history for the buildings. Once the information from the document review and interviews is collected and understood, an overall inspection of the current conditions at the buildings takes place. This is done from both the interior and exterior of the buildings. Starting from the interiors, areas of leakage and any damage to the interior finishes are identified. This can be noted on a, a, a plan, or you can use elevation drawings and note where at the interior of these conditions were observed. Next, the consultant goes outside and surveys conditions from grade level. Binoculars or spotting scopes and photography equipment are often used to identify areas of exterior deterioration and correlate these areas with conditions of concern that were noted inside the building. If access to an adjacent building is available, it can provide another vantage point to inspect the buildings. At this college campus, access was available from an adjacent tower structure to allow an overall review of the roofs to be included in the assessment. Roofs and roof terrace access also allows observations to be made at the interior sides of roof parapets and at setback walls. During this initial overall inspection, Areas are identified where close-up inspections would be useful in evaluating the conditions at the building enclosure. Aerial lifts and swing staging are often used to view upper sections of the buildings during the investigations. At tall structures, a difficult access team can be used where installation of swing staging is difficult or cost prohibitive. Employing established industrial rope access techniques, difficult access team members perform close-up visual inspections, material testing, and non-destructive testing. Inspection aids can be used to supplement the visual inspection or be used where a close-up visual inspection is not possible. Drone photography is one such aid that uses small, unmanned aerial systems and pilots to conduct structural and architectural inspections and assessments at upper levels of buildings. This can be done at a fraction of the cost of a hands-on close-up inspection. Infrared thermography is another valuable tool that is used to identify thermal anomalies in building components. 
revealing areas of air and moisture infiltration in wall and roof systems. One of our new tools is robotic panoramic photography, which organizes data in a concise and accurate manner using remote sensing data capture to quickly and safely collect data for all types of structures. All of the conditions observed need to be collected for inclusion in the management plan. Collection tools used include notations on drawings, site sketches, photographs, tablet-based software, and material sampling. Often conditions of observations of concealed conditions are necessary to complete the assessment of the building envelope. Destructive testing is one method that involves dismantling portions of the building envelope to permit observations of concealed conditions. This can include steel embedded in masonry, the condition of roof insulation and roof decks, and the components in window and curtain wall systems. However, destructive testing can be physically intrusive, time intensive, and costly. As an alternate, non-destructive methods can be used to understand concealed conditions without altering or damaging the building's components. A few examples of non-destruction destructive evaluation are corrosion rate assessment, reinforcement detection, ground penetrating radar, and ultrasonic inspection of steel. Various other types of testing are sometimes used during the investigation. These testing procedures were developed by the American Society for Testing and Materials and the American Architectural Manufacturers Association. Some of these include water leakage testing, which can determine the source and cause of leakage, identify the path of the water, and aid in repairing design solutions. Another is air infiltration testing, which can determine how windows and curtain walls are functioning in resisting air leakage into the building. The low voltage test method is a safe and reliable tool for locating faults and breaches in single and multi-ply membrane waterproofing systems. This equipment is lightweight, portable, and adjustable, allowing it to be used easily. The equipment can be used at exposed roofing membranes as well as those covered with overburden. Samples taken during the inspection can be brought to a laboratory to analyze the materials. This can include physical properties and composition analysis, durability potential, and corrosion assessment. And now Scott will explain types of deterioration often found during an investigation. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> I'm going to begin by reviewing some of the types of deterioration that are commonly found in an asset management assessment. And then we'll review some critical components of an asset management report. One of the primary objectives in identifying types of building envelope deterioration include public safety and some hidden hazards. I'll start with some examples of some hidden hazards, uh, and then I'll outline some of the components that make up building envelope that we would review, both the, the functional performance of these materials, weather resistance, capability, serviceability, 
um, material fail failures and that type of thing. Cracks and spalls in, in uh, masonry. Oftentimes it deteriorate. Um, this, this type of deterioration is not obvious uh, during uh, a review. Damage may be at locations of the building that are difficult to see when viewed from the ground. It might be hidden by projecting features of the building. Uh, incipient spalls might be uh, hidden under overlying materials, such as what you see in the uh, bottom picture there. Um, spalling of stone may not be visible from one perspective, but might be visible from another. Loose roofing materials or metal flashings you might have slate roofs or tile roofs that have cracked tile or slate, uh, slip slate, um, displaced slate that uh, move down the roof surface and off of the building, or they might get stuck in gutters or in a, a roof valley where they're uh, later blown off or, or washed out by heavy rains or winds. Open cracks and joints in masonry. Uh, open joints allow water to get into the wall system. Um, they can cause corrosion of uh, underlying steel structures, which causes expansion forces within the structure uh, from the corrosion, which expands in there. Um, that can cause um, additional cracking of the masonry, which then allows additional water into the wall and can pro propagate further deterioration of the wall. Cracked or broken glass. Open cracks uh, that can be caused by deterioration of window frames, deteriorated lead canes, loose caulking compound. Broken glass can be caused by impact damage, glass edge damage, or surface damage during handling or installation. Uh, that can weaken the glass, causing it to break during uh, high winds or thermal movements of the framing system. Spontaneous breakage could also occur in tempered glass um, by inclusions in the glass. Displacement of masonry. Um, this can be caused by infiltration of water through concrete caps, cracks in the concrete caps, uh, thermal and uh, freeze thaw movement can occur, that frost jacking can push bricks out of the wall. Water infiltration through parapet joints can run down, uh, affecting the, the bedding plane of, uh, of a stone and cause free saw damage, push it out of the wall. In some cases, uh, minor hazards, hazards like those can be removed during, um, during it or immediately during, during, uh, an assessment. Um, some of the temporary measures that might be required for those types of spalls include uh, safety in our debris netting, uh, partial demolition, and possibly uh, temporary waterproofing of those types of, of, of damages. It might also include sidewalk bridging or enclosed scaffolding. Whatever the material cause of the deterioration, falling debris from a high elevation can cause irreparable damage to property or cause harm to pedestrians or passerbys or, or worse. These types of conditions should always be treated as priority one or immediate action when it comes to incorporation into an asset management plan. Now I'll outline some of the major components that make up the building envelope. There are many types of variations of, of roofing membranes and systems for low sloped and steep sloped roofings. Um, some some examples for low sloped roofing in, in ply, uh, in, um, include single ply roofing membranes, EPDM, TPO, PB, PVC, etc. Um, multiple ply roofing systems like modified bitumen roofing or built up roofing. Steep slope sy systems can be 
asphalt or slight shingles. They might be tile or metal panels or any type of uh, metal pan system. Each type of roof should be assessed based on their own inherent qualities, good or bad. Evaluation of roof, roofing system should include its age, the condition of the membrane, laps, and flashing. Special attention should be given to the roof, roofing system's ability to adequately drain water, including drain placement, gutters, overflow systems, and the respective conditions. Roofs are subject to extreme weather conditions such as UV exposure, extreme rain, hail, and snow events, as well as extreme wind uplift pressures, all of which can cause damage to the roof, their attachment, or their ability to maintain waterproof integrity. All of these conditions should be considered when evaluating a roofing system. There are all types of fenestrations that should be included in the system, like windows, curtain walls, storefronts, entry doors, skylights. Some of the things that should be looked out for when investigating the, these items are interior leakage, like Paul mentioned earlier, uh, stains on window sills, window jams, stains or corrosion of window framing members. From the outside, glazing gaskets can, can shrink and pull away, allowing water to enter the drainage cha channels within the frame. Weep systems can become clogged, preventing water from ex exiting the system. Sealant joints within the framing can degrade, allowing penetration of the interior. Uh, perimeter seals may be failing. These types of failures can be intensified by wind pressures that force additional volumes of water that have entered the framing system into the building. For this reason, um, testing of the windows may be warranted to determine the extent of the failure. There are many types of plaza level, below level, and under slab waterproofing systems available. Um, Evaluation of the effectiveness of these systems is often uh, based on leak history reports, design and installation records, or knowledge of the uh, subsurface drainage and water, uh, the water and drainage conditions. We can also look at cavity walls, resistive barriers, uh, or vapor barriers, and their respective through wall flashings and weak systems. Now we'll review a little bit of the critical components of the asset management report. Uh, and the following is what one of our reports might look like, and it's the type of assessment findings that you can expect from any provider of these services. Should include a title sheet. Um, this should identify the buildings, the location of the buildings, the client, and the consultant. It should also include a table of contents. Um, this should list all of the contents of the report, including all of the buildings. It might be a single building or it might be a group of buildings. Um, but each portion of the report should be included for each of those buildings. Executive summary should be uh, included. Um, the executive summary can be used by the client to determine um, the contents of the port report and who will benefit from it. It should be gr brief, concise, easy to read, summary of the entire report, and it, it should identify all of the hazardous conditions, and it should outline prioritized recommendations with, the, with estimated construction costs. This should be followed by an introduction uh, and building background, um, the purpose and scope of the report. This should be developed during the pre-proposal and planning scope, planning and scope development phase of the project, and it should be summarized in the report. It should identify the numbers and building uh, in the assessment. It should provide a site plan identifying the buildings and their locations. 
to determine the, the end user's use of the report, how, how it will be utilized. The owner might, owner or prospective owners might use it for, for budgeting purposes only. They might not be interested in the fine detail of where, um, and what the deficiencies are. Uh, property managers, building engineers, they may be interested in both for developing construction documents, uh, and bidding and for the locations of, of detailed information. Maintenance staff may be only interested in the details of it uh, so that they can maintain the building. Uh, it, it should be determined by the client's budgeting requirements and it should ensure that the end product meets all of the needs of the end user. Should also include a description of each building, the size of the building, its location and use. Is this a high-rise building in an urban area with sur surrounded by sidewalks and streets, or is it a group of buildings in a suburban area uh, out in the middle of nowhere? Um, what's the building structure? Is it steel frame, concrete frame, wood frame? What are the the general physical conditions of the building. Has the building been maintained? Uh, when were the last maintenance or repairs made? What were they? You should identify uh, major building components. What's the facade component? Is it curtain wall, mass masonry wall, cavity wall system, some type of panel system? Should identify the roof types. You know, steep slope roof, low slope roof. What's the quantity? What's the size and the locations of the roof areas? Are there below grade levels in your, in your building? Basements? What are the uh, below grade waterproofing systems? Are there amenities over occupied spaces? Plazas, fountains, planters, hardscapes or softscapes? How are they used? How are they waterproofed and finished? This should also include a summary of reviewed documents and interviews. What's the status of the warranties? Have warranty claims been made or issued? Have repairs been made? What are, are there any maintenance records? Is there documentation of leak history, job tickets, or tenant complaints? What's the status of those histories? or repairs? Are there previous assessment reports? What were the report deficiencies and what's, what's the status of those repairs? Were there original documents to be reviewed? Were there irregularities to, uh, discovered during that review? What were they? Look at those irregularities during the assessment. All of these things need to be looked at during the assessment. The report should include observed deficiencies. Observations should be provided for each defect type. They should be categorized according to the building components. Should provide detailed description of each of the defects and its locations. You could also provide photo, photographic documentation exhibiting the defect. Or, and you might also provide drawings that show the defect locations. This might be included in the body of the report or it might be attached as an appendix. Documentation of test reports should also be included. Test reports should include the date, weather and time of the test, the test locations, description of test specimens, description of test, the, the test itself, and what's the result of the test? Did it pass or fail based on established performance requirements? That could be also included in the body of the report or attached as, as an appendix. Observation should be followed by evaluations, which explain how the building component is intended to function, explains the causes and effects of the observed conditions, explains interrelationships of building components, and list and explains the pertinent sections of the building code and standards. 
to expand on that, evaluations should provide the general condition of each component, assess the component's deficiency, its relevance, and its potential effects. The cause of the deterioration, is it material failure, natural aging of the material? What are the contributing factors? Does the efficiency contribute to the ongoing deterioration of the building? What are the effects on other components? Does the deficiency create an unsafe condition or make safe uh, actions warranted and what type of safety measures are necessary? This would be followed by recommendations. They should be general in nature, but enough to develop construction cost estimates, and they should be prioritized to meet the client's needs. Um, they should consider the effects of the appearance on the building. They should determine the quantities of, of deficiencies in their locations. They can, should, should consider the severity of conditions and client budget for prioritization. Um, they should determine the need for further investigation. Is further investigation needed in order to determine the cause of, uh, or severity of the condition? Is testing needed in order to assess the durability of a building component? You should provide scope and intended purpose for the investigation in this section. Following the recommendations, cost information should be provided. Probable costs should be based on current market values. Uh, escalation of costs for work to be performed in preceding or succeeding fiscal year should be provided. These costs should include contractor labor, material, services, equipment, and access to the work area. They might include construction management fees if necessary. Um, they should also include cost for additional recommendation or testing. And if the design is of appropriate repair is necessary, professional design fees may be included in these. Repair and maintenance should be prioritized. Uh, prioritization of maintenance and repair should, consideration should be, should include maintenance schedules. Anticipated available funding, uh, severity of conditions, and coordination of phase or phasing of repairs in common areas and access to repair areas for maximum value. If you have 10 different repairs on one elevation of the building, it might be wise to perform all those repairs at the same time in order to reduce cost in accessing those items at a later date. Itemized table of recommendations should be included. Um, they should incorporate the building component, the description of the work or maintenance items, the quantity, unit, and unit price cost of each item, and the total cost of each item. Priority of repairs, replacement, and, and maintenance should be included, and they should project the cost for subsequent years' work. Here's an example of an itemized recommendation. Um, they should, at the minimum, include prioritization of recommendation, uh, recommended deficiencies, repairs and maintenance, the facility name, and a description of the work, total construction cost, estimated pro uh, projected cost for work in future years, the complexity of the table, and this information needs to meet the client's needs and should reflect what he needs um, to show in these reports. This specific example has the condition, uh, description, and location of roofing and fa facade uh, deficiencies, the material type, the, the quantity of those deficiencies in the units, and the unit cost, and the total cost for each of those uh, deficiencies. And then it also provides um, immediate repairs that are necessary, those uh, precautionary safety um, type repairs that, that may need to be implemented. Um, and then it provides a short-term, a mid-term, and a long-term cost projected for 
for um, things that are prioritized in higher levels. Um, cost estimates may be limited. The, the owner may not want to have uh, a breakdown of every single deficiency. They may want to have uh, an estimated unit, uh, an estimated cost for uh, uh, the level one, level two, level three um, portions of the the uh, of the work, or they may just want a single price. Different own, owners may want to only prioritize cost estimates, uh, cost estimates without itemization. So, um, with that, um, I'm going to that concludes my portion of the presentation, and I'll turn it back over to Paul. Okay, thanks, Scott. So after we prepare this report and submit it to the client, and the client has had time to review the report, we'll typically schedule a meeting to review the report, to review its findings, discuss modifications to the report that the client may like to see, um, we discuss additional investigation if required, and begin planning for future action. So now we'd like to conclude today's presentation. In summary, building asset management is understanding the value of building envelope components and developing a plan to maximize this value by planning for the maintenance, repair, restoration, and or replacement of these components. The plan is developed starting with an inventory of the buildings to be included in the plan, assessing the conditions at the buildings, identifying areas where repairs are required, developing an asset management report with prioritized recommendations and developing a budget to implement the recommendations. Some takeaways from this presentation include the building envelope is a valuable asset that must be maintained to assure it maximizes its service life in a cost-effective manner. An asset management plan can be used as the basis to assist those responsible for planning, maintenance, and funding for buildings. The plan can be used to manage multi-structure complexes or individual buildings. The plan provides an outline of prioritized, anticipated repair, replacement, and maintenance costs for planning future capital reserves, and it defines the activities necessary to realize an organization's asset management objectives related to building exteriors. And I'd like to now say uh, thank you. And we'll turn this over to Liz for any uh, questions. All right. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Scott. As a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box and hit submit. And we'll try to get to as many questions as possible for the end of the hour. But if we don't have time to get to your question during the call, either Scott or Paul will follow up with you afterward. All right. Let's go ahead and take our first question. How often do I need to update my report? Well, this, this can... Um depends on what your portfolio is. And if you add um, buildings to the portfolio um, or if you make changes to the portfolio, like uh, major renovations or repairs, uh, the report should be updated to include those so that future year's adjustments can be made in the, um, the budgeting. Okay. Our next question. Can you please provide examples of when further investigation will be needed? What wouldn't be expected to be included in this kind of evaluation? Okay. Um, one thing would be um, 
if we see something that triggers the concern of a major, major structural defect, like we see major cracking in the wall, um, we may want to recommend an analysis of the framing behind the wall or the wall system to uh, determine if further investigation is needed. That would um, that would be one type of thing. Something that triggers a concern that a structural problem exists. Okay. Our next question. Please elaborate on how low voltage testing works. Does it require a special membrane, etc.? Well, it, it can, uh, depending on what the, the system is. Um, Basically, a low system voltage system uses the, the membrane itself as a, an isolator. Um, you use a, uh, a loop around the perimeter of the area. Uh, some equipment uses a loop within its own self um, to, to create. Um, and you use wands to, um, to put energy into the water that's on top of the surface and it travels and makes a loop between uh and identifies a, a penetration in in the, the material itself um it'll direct you to a penetration so there are systems where you put a conductive membrane underneath a roofing system or a waterproofing system that allows um better access and can be can be done over top of a, um, say, a plaza system or um, planter area on top of uh, uh, of a roofing system. I'm not sure if that really addresses your your overall question, but that's generally how it works. Okay, we'll take another question. What kind of software do you recommend to your client to keep track of the inventory? Um, we'll have to really get back, as I'm not too familiar with software, but um, an Excel program is one way that, uh, an easy way that somebody could take care of their building. They can list uh, the components of the envelope and um, years, the year or years that, say, the roofs were replaced, uh, where masonry repairs were done, repointing, um, et cetera. Okay, our next question. Do you find that building owners are making product selections to address repair and restoration needs, or is WJE making those decisions and recommendations? Um, I'd say in general, we make the recommendations, and then we will review that recommendation with the client and um, discuss if it meets his need try to explain why it meets his need, or uh, listen to some, listen to suggestions that the owner does have because they know their building better than anyone else usually. Okay, the next question. You cited water infiltration testing as a non-destructive condition assessment method. Can you elaborate on how this is done? Are you using a moisture meter? Why don't you take this one, Scott? You do more tests than I do. Um, cited water infiltration testing as a non-destructive condition assessment method. So this might be um, done in the type in the form of uh, like an ASTM E1105 testing for windows which um, which you use to put a uh, to, to assess the air infiltration or the water infiltration of a window system this could be uh, one one way that you could do that um, water testing doesn't always necessarily um, mean that there's uh, doesn't involve 
uh, non, uh, destructive testing. It can be um, a, a form of testing like uh, water absorption into brick masonry where you put a um, collection box on the outside of the wall with a spray box inside of it um, and collect uh, runoff water and determine how much water the absorbed uh, it is absorbed uh, in the wall in a certain period of time. So those are some of the kind of tests that, that are done with water that are non-destructive. Some other tests, um, you know, water tests that you might perform might be followed up by um, probes to determine how water is getting through, through the building. Okay, our next question. When you showed the robotic photo collage to assess an elevation, is that set up in such a way that you can repeat the exact same photos years later and can compare the images to observe changes? Yes, yeah, so you just you would need to set it up in the same location and um, hopefully try to pick the same time of the year and weather conditions so that uh, you can review what happened in a certain time period. Okay, our next question. Please expand on the process of sounding masonry units and what leads to a determination of which units are in danger. Okay, um, I'll start. Sounding typically involves tapping lightly with a, usually with a, a steel or a lead hammer. Um, a lead hammer is better because it won't damage the masonry. Um, sound materials usually ring when you hit them. Um, and something with uh, a spall or delamination below the surface, you'll feel like a thud. And um, this way we can map out areas of the wall where um, problems exist that are not visually apparent. Do you have anything else for that, Scott? No, I think uh, you explained it. Okay. Okay. Our next question, how often does WJE coordinate repairs with qualified contractors during the repairs design phase to arrive at uh, cost or time effective solutions? And is this done on a project basis? Um. If the client has a contractor on board, um, typically what we will do is we can we would, if necessary, we uh, would coordinate any types of probes or close-up inspections with that contractor. Um, we would develop the repair plans and share them sometimes with the contractor and the client and always we would listen to the contractor's recommendations for improvement and review costs so that we can get the most cost effective solution that will um, provide long term success. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next question. What would be your recommendation to the owner if the building has different types of roofs for the building? In other words, tear off all the roofs and install one system or something else? Um, no, I think it would be dependent on the condition of each roof level or roof area. Um, sometimes it's, it's convenient. Uh, if you're going to be replacing different roof areas to replace them with a similar type roofing system so that uh, maintenance could be uh, simplified. But um, no, each, I would, I would base the, the repair, maintenance, or replacement um, based on the actual condition of the roof, how long it, um, uh, what, what's its age, what's its surface life, how much life does it have left in it? Okay, our next question. <clears throat> Should the frequency of report updates 
be discussed up front with a consultant who does the initial report so that the initial report spells out how often the report should be updated? Um, yes, but again, I think that would depend after the initial report is completed. It's like when you, uh, kind of like when you go to the doctor for a test, if everything is good, you don't have to have another report, another test for several years. If something is, uh, a concern, but not an immediate problem, then your next test should be at a shorter interval. Okay, our next question. Does the cost estimate include access cost, which is often a major part of the cost for a facade project? Yes. Yeah, the cost estimate should include access as well. All right. We've got time for about one more question. What information should be added to the specifications of a new building in order to create a backbone for one of these reports? Do I handle that part? Um, I'm thinking. Usually the specification is, um, if it describes the materials accurately that are being used, um, and if any materials are changed during construction, any substitutions made, if that's updated in um, the project records, then that should be uh, sufficient to assist in um, developing a report down uh, years down the road to continue to maintain the asset. The most, if the specification, again, if it's accurate to what's there, that's all that's really needed. It should also be, um, should also make sure it properly requires the, um, the submission of submittals during construction and um, provide records of submittals and, and those types of things. Um, As-built drawings uh, are, are important in order to go back and look at things that, uh, you know, on a 10-year-old building that was uh, um, constructed that uh, you're able to, to research, you know, what the actual products are in this building or what what uh, different types of changes took place during construction and, um, you know, are there any, any, any issues caused by those changes? All right. Um, thank you, Paul, and thank you, Scott, again. It was a very informative presentation, and thank you all for joining us. We hope you found it educational. As a reminder, you will receive an email this afternoon that will include a link to an on-demand version of this webinar that you can use to rewatch at your convenience or share with any colleagues who weren't able to join us live today. And that email will also include a link to access related resources, including a PDF copy of the presentation, as well as a link to download your certificate of completion. If you have any questions about the topics covered in the presentation today, today please don't hesitate to reach out to Scott or Paul. Their contact information is here on the screen. They'd be happy to chat with you further. And if you have any questions about the webinar itself, please reach out to me, Liz Pimper, at lpimper at wje.com. So again, thank you so much for your time, and we hope you have a great rest of the day.